Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, today we will be continuing with uh, the topic of uh, induction motors. Uh, last week we have been talking about the construction, uh, how the motor is made, and uh, today we will be talking about the properties of uh, the induction motor, uh, what can we expect. Uh, last week we have also covered a little bit uh, the torque speed diagram. Today we will be talking about it in, in more detail. And we will see how, that, how the parameters will affect uh, the properties of uh, the induction motor, especially uh, the torque speed characteristic. Um, okay, so uh, last week we have finished approximately here. Uh, we have uh, covered the equivalent circuit diagram. Uh, please remember that the equivalent circuit diagram is uh, only a representation. Uh, how can we describe the properties of the motor with electrical circuits? It doesn't have anything common uh, in common uh, with mechanical properties. So uh, the purpose of the equivalent circuit diagram is to uh, allow the calculations of uh, electrical and mechanical properties with electrical schematics. So here uh, we see we have uh, the main magnetic circuit which creates the magnetic flux in the stator. Here we see the inductance and uh, resistance of the stator winding. So those are direct values that you will get from uh, the lab tests uh, on the class. And uh, on the right-hand side, we have uh, the properties of the rotor, uh, especially uh, the rotor inductance and rotor resistance. Uh, here in the middle, there is the air gap where uh, the power is being transferred from the stator into the rotor, and this is creating torque. If you uh, want to calculate, for example, efficiency of the motor, you need to get two components. You need to get... Uh, resist, uh, you need to get uh, input power and then out output, output power. The output power is the power, is the mechanical power that you have on the shaft. So it's the torque and speed. And the, the input power is, uh, of course, this output power plus some losses. Uh, and uh, we are able to measure the input power with some electric instruments like wattmeters, for example. Uh, so the input power here in my text will be uh, denoted by P sub, like uh, P supply, uh, and uh, it, it can be calculated from voltage and from current. Uh, since we have been talking about three-phase motors, uh, it's three times that value, and uh, this will give us the estimate of uh, the input power, the, the measurement of the input power. Now this input power, uh, we subtract losses that are created in the stator and losses in the magnetic circuit. And what's left is a relatively big part of uh, the power. And this is being transferred through the air gap into the rotor. In the rotor, uh, this, uh, induced, uh, this magnetic flux creates current and then uh, it works by interaction of uh, the current in the rotor and uh, the stator, ro stator magnetic field. Uh, so this is the input power. Uh, the losses that are uh, created in the rotor are dependent on the speed difference between uh, the rotor speed and between uh, the stator synchronous speed. Uh, the stator synchronous speed is constant. It is uh, a function of the power supply frequency. If, uh, for example, we will be talking about our three-phase network with frequency 50 hertz, uh, then it's 50 hertz times 60, so it's, it's in RPM, and this will give you 3,000. So the synchronous speed of uh, the motor with, two pole, with one pole pair, means two poles, uh, is 3,000 RPM. Uh, 3,000. Uh, if you have a different construction, you may have uh, 1,500 and, and so on. Uh, and uh, the rotor speed is a function of the load. The more you load the motor, uh, the more the speed is decreasing. Uh, 
So uh, the difference or the ratio between synchronous speed and the current speed of the motor is called slip and uh, slip is uh, a variable that, that we will use uh, to express all the torque speed characteristics and other properties of the motor. So here you can see that uh, the slip here, that's the, the slip, this is the rotor resistance and uh, this is the developed power in the motor. Uh, of course it's still an electrical circuit so it's basically resistance times square of the current. It's a three-phase circuit so it's three times and uh, the resistance of the rotor is being recalculated in the equivalent circuit diagram with the value of slip uh, which is this side of this, uh, of this equation. So this is what you measure or what you would measure in the rotor with, um, with an ohmmeter for example and this recalculates the value uh, to the uh, actual uh, value of the slip. Uh, the output power is the difference uh, between uh, what can I get here on the rotor minus losses. And losses can be mechanical. Um, in, the, in this case, it's a friction loss uh, that is created, for example, in the bearings. Uh, it can be vintage loss that is uh, created by air resistance when the motor is, is rotating and so on. Uh, then the total motor efficiency, that's a typical uh, well, normal form, formula that, that you, uh, I, think, I think you know it. Uh, it's calculated by a ratio between the output power and the, the, the input power. Uh, the efficiency of an induction motor is uh, relatively high. By relatively high, I mean it um, can be 90%, for example. And uh, the efficiency uh, is uh, a function of speed. It's a function of torque also. So uh, if you uh, would measure the efficiency of an induction motor for different speeds and different torques, you'll find out that it's changing. So uh, the efficiency is typically specified for the nominal point. You have a motor uh, on the name plate. You will find nominal torque, nominal speed, nominal power and eventually also nominal efficiency. And uh, the goal of the manufacturer is uh, to place the point of maximum efficiency uh, near the uh, op operating point. So if you have uh, a system that is operating at a fixed speed, then uh, you will be paying uh, less energy when the motor has highest efficiency. Uh, of course, this is not possible in uh, variable speed drives, so in applications where you need to change the speed or, or torque of your, of your machine. And then um, you can plot something that's called an efficiency map, which is basically a dependence of uh, efficiency uh, on torque and on speed. So it's like a 3D chart and you will find that it has areas uh, of maximal efficiency where I would have um, the lowest losses uh, and this can be somewhere in the middle of the map, but it really depends on the construction. Uh, the efficiency of an induction motor is uh, definitely smaller uh, than the efficiency of uh, transformers. Because in transformers, uh, if you remember transformers and their equivalent circuit diagram, uh, we had exactly the same equivalent circuit diagram. So. Uh, we had the same losses, same types of losses in the transformer and in the induction motor. Uh, both devices will have stator and rotor losses. That's for uh, the uh, induction motor. Uh, for the transformer, we had primary winding losses and secondary winding losses. But in principle, it's exactly the same. Uh, we also had uh, eddy current losses and hysteresis losses in both. That's the same here. Uh, what we don't have in a transformer are, uh, of course, mechanical losses. There are no moving parts in a transformer, so a transformer has smaller losses and therefore higher efficiency. Uh, in an induction motor, we have moving parts, so we will have mechanical losses in bearings, 
uh, we will have um, losses uh, due to aerodynamic forces when the motor is rotating and so on. Uh, so the efficiency of an induction motor is a little bit smaller than induction of uh, a comparable transformer. Um, but it's still high, it can be 90%, can be 85%, can be 92 Dependent, It depends really on the construction and on the, on the materials. Uh, what you see here is uh, an idea about the different components of the losses uh, that we have in the induction motor and uh, especially how we can calculate uh, those losses. So this is the input power. So it's three times the voltage times current. Uh, here we have stator copper losses. So this is the stator resistance times square of the current. Since we are still at three phase motor, it's three times. Uh, stator iron losses, you see they depend on the voltage square divided by uh, the, resist the magnetic resistance of, uh, of the stator sheets. Uh, so here, uh, the higher the voltage, the higher the losses. Uh, this is the power in the air gap. And if the power in the air gap, uh, if we want that that's high, uh, we need to make a small air gap. So the smaller the air gap, the higher the magnetic flux you can produce and uh, the better the torque. On the other hand, uh, if you make the air gap too small, you may have mechanical problems. So you can't make a very small air gap, unfortunately. Uh, then we have rotor copper losses. So this is the rotor resistance recalculated by the use of slip. And then he here we have additional losses like ventilation, friction in the bearings and so on. And this is what you will get on the output on the shaft but you can connect to, to some load, to some wheel, and, and, and so on. OK, now we will discuss uh, in detail uh, how uh, the individual parameters uh, are affecting uh, the properties of uh, this induction motor. Uh, we will start with um, a simplified uh, equivalent circuit diagram. So uh, this is a simplification that is using impedances. In the circuit that we have seen so far, uh, we have used uh, resistance and inductance, so two components. But we can uh, cover this uh, into impedances, which simplifies a little bit the schematics, uh, since uh, this is a, just a single component. Here we have three components. So this represents the impedance of the stator. This represents the impedance of the rotor. And note here that we have, uh, we're still using the slip. So this is still a function of speed. So this part is a variable with speed, but this part is constant with speed. And here, uh, this is the part that represents the magnetic circuit. And this is also uh, constant with, uh, with slip, so constant with speed. We obviously not go through those equations. Here there's just, uh, uh, this is the, impede the reactance of the rotor uh, plus resistance of the rotor, and this is the recalculated value uh, with, by, by slip. Uh, the motor current, of course, depends on the voltage that you connect on the motor. If you uh, look on this kind of circuit, then we are, are supplying the voltage here to some terminal. Uh, I would like to stress out that this is an equivalent circuit diagram for a single phase only. So uh, in the motor, you have this three times there. Uh, here, uh, this is uh, the, the supply voltage. We are typically uh, measuring uh, either line to line voltage or line to neutral voltage. And dependent on uh, what value do, do we give, uh, we divide it by square root of three or we don't. Uh, and here we see that the stator current, so the current flowing into the circuit over here, uh, that's normal Ohm's law, will depend on the supply voltage divided by uh, the impedance uh, that is being seen here on this, on this circuit. So here we can see that uh, we have these two impedances are connected in parallel. So that's 
this part of this uh, of this uh, no, this is just the rotor current. But if I would calculate this by impedances, I would uh, connect this impedance in parallel to that impedance, and then th this combination is in series to the stator impedance. So uh, both the stator impedance and rotor impedance will have an effect on the current. Uh, and uh, here you can see that the current will be variable also with speed, so with slip because if I'm changing this component with speed, uh, it will have an effect on the stator. On the other hand, uh, we can also see that uh, there is a second component of the current going through the magnetic circuit. So uh, this component of the current is, using, uh, is used to create the magnetic flux. So even if uh, here this impedance of the rotor would be infinite, you would still have some current that is flowing in the mo into the motor. And this current is used uh, to create the magnetic flux. So an induction motor, even if you would remove the motor, the, the rotor over here, it would ha still have some non-zero current uh, that is flowing through the stator windings. And we will see that later uh, on the charts that it does not start uh, at zero current. Uh, in fact, uh, in uh, induction motors, it's quite typical that the current in the windings is not changing sig too significantly uh, with the changes of the load. So you have the motor unloaded, it takes a relatively high current, which could be like 60, maybe 70% of the nominal current, and uh, only the 30 or 40% uh, are covering the power that you take, from, uh, take out from the load. So it's a typical behavior of an induction motor that it starts with a very high current relatively. Uh, we can calculate the uh, motor input power and uh, motor output power. Uh, so, uh, for the uh, apparent power, we know that it's three, ta it's three times voltage times, times current. And then we can calculate the real part of this power and imaginary part. Uh, so, this is, uh, the, uh, the, this is the active power and this is the reactive power. And in fact, the reactive power part is uh, what is uh, being used uh, to create the magnetic flux since uh, the motor acts as an inductor. So from the point of view of the network, uh, the induction motor is an inductor, and uh, it's just creating magnetic fields, and the, the energy is traveling to the motor and back between the, the power network. So uh, at the end, we can calculate the efficiency if we have the input power and mechanical power. Uh, and uh, if we plot the dependence of uh, the powers on slip, we will see something like this. Uh, here you see this is slip, and this is in percent. So slip 0% means uh, that uh, here we have uh, zero difference between uh, the synchronous speed and between nominal speed. So this is synchronous speed here. So that this is, for example, 1,500 RPM. And uh, here, uh, slip 100% means that the motor is standing still. And this is a chart of mechanical power. So uh, it gives, an, gives, gives us an idea uh, where can we find the maximum mechanical power of the motor. So here we have synchronous speed. So the motor is never running at synchronous speed without an external help. And we are situating the operating point somewhere here. So uh, the maximum power that you can create by with the motor is uh, typically smaller, well, the nominal power is smaller than the maximum power that you can achieve. Uh, the typical ratio between the maximum power and nominal power is uh, roughly two. 
So you can see here that the maximum power, if you overload the motor, is about twice uh, of the nominal power. So uh, one very interesting property of uh, induction motors is that you can overload them at least for a short period of time and you can demand higher power uh, from the motor. So for example if you want to start the, the, the machine uh, you may need a higher power to overcome friction uh, or, or overcome other forces. You may do this with an induction motor uh, and you may do this for a short time before it overheats. Uh, then here we have maximum power and this corresponds to a point uh, where uh, we have some slip. Uh, here the motor is operating typically only in this range, so between synchronous speed and between the nominal operating point and you can see that in this region the characteristic of the motor uh, looks uh, an, as a nice linear function. So when we are operating the induction motor uh, near the operating point here we may assume that it has a linear torque speed characteristic but if we want to do this in a larger range we see that this is not uh, a linear function. But typically we are assuming that we are moving only a little bit uh, around the operating point and therefore here we have a linear function. This chart continues all the way to slip uh, 100%. Slip 100% means uh, stand still, the motor is blocked or it just is, is just starting and the motor is and the, the power of the motor is moving along this characteristic. So uh, the power that you can demand is slowly increasing. Uh, those are just um, some uh, mechanical equations that are uh, quite known. So uh, how to recalculate torque if we know mechanical power and uh, angular speed. I think that's clear. Uh, this is an equation that we haven't seen so far, I think. Uh, it relates speed in RPM uh, to slip. So here you can see that if slip is uh, going from uh, 0 to 1 in this case, uh, then if it's 0, we have synchronous speed. So mechanical speed is equal to synchronous speed. If uh, slip is 1, we have speed 0 and it stands still. Uh, now if we plot the uh, torque slip characteristic we will see what is the behavior of the induction motor in terms of torque. It is similar to uh, the power versus slip characteristic what it has to be because here uh, if I just divide this uh, by angular speed. So I am dividing this by a constant uh, so it will look exactly the same only the scale will be uh, different. So here uh, we have slip from 0 to in this case 80 percent we may have that to, uh, to, uh, to 100. Uh, again this is synchronous speed so this is for example 1500 and here 100 percent slip would be standstill. Uh, the operating point is again situated somewhere around here. So somewhere at this position would be the nominal operating point that you will find on the nameplate. And uh, again, we will have a maximum torque that is typically about doubled uh, the nominal, nominal torque. Uh, you can also see that here at slip 100%, the characteristic will not go to zero. So uh, the induction motor has uh, some torque during startup. That's very useful because if we want to start the motor, um, we will not disconnect the load from the motor. So uh, it needs to overcome the load when it's starting and therefore 
uh, it's very useful to have uh, some, uh, some startup talk. Uh, of course, we can influence the properties of this, uh, of this torque and of this motor by changing uh, the construction of the motor, especially by changing the rotor resistance. So by changing the rotor resistance, we can change the shape of this characteristic and we can change uh, different, uh, different startup torques uh, and of, cor of course different losses. Uh, we can plot this torque speed characteristic also uh, as a function of speed. So instead of uh, having slip on the x-axis, uh, we can use also, also speed. Uh, so here is such an example. So here you have speed. Uh, here uh, we have um, speed from two, 200 to 1800 RPM. And uh, here you have torque. So this is exactly the same characteristic like this, only the slip is uh, recalculated to speed in revolutions per minute in this case. Uh, we can see that for this construction of the motor, uh, here we will have synchronous speed. So synchronous speed, we need to have zero torque because we, um, when we have discussed the principle it's not possible to have some torque at synchronous speed. The current in uh, the rotor is zero. And uh, the operating point is specified somewhere here, so in the linear part of the characteristic. And you can see also here we have uh, maximal, maximal torque. And the startup torque uh, would be somewhere here. So for this construction of, this, of the motor that you see specifically here, uh, it, will, it would be, well, I would say maybe 50, maybe 40 newton meters, and the operating point is somewhere around, let's say, 80 newton meters. So in this case, uh, it is, uh, the startup torque is smaller than uh, the nominal torque. If you change the construction of the motor and the rotor resistance, uh, you may have a higher startup torque and a different shape of the torque speed characteristic. Uh, this part of the torque speed characteristic is only uh, one part, one quadrant of, uh, of the chart that we can plot in total. If we uh, want to use the machine uh, in a different mode than a motor mode, uh, we can, of course, do that. We can use an induction motor as a generator and we can use it as a brake. And then the total and the complete torque speed characteristic looks like this. So far, we have discussed only this section, this first quadrant. So in this first quadrant, the machine works as a motor. You apply electrical power and you take mechanical power from the shaft. Uh, this is synchronous speed and this is standstill. We see that here we have the operating point and here uh, we have the maximum torque. Uh, we can use the induction motor as a generator and it means we will be mechanically driving the shaft to a higher than synchronous speed. So uh, if I have some mechanical source like a turbine or, uh, or some wheel or whatever you can imagine. Uh, we can drive the motor above the synchronous speed that is given by the frequency of the power network and it will produce power, so it will be working like a generator. Uh, this is the characteristic in generator mode, so you can see it starts from slip zero. Slip zero means synchronous speed, so for example if I would have uh, a two pole per motor on a 50 hertz frequency network, uh, this would be 1,500. And if I drive the motor to a faster speed than 1,500, it will create power and I will be able to use this power in the power network. So here you see it has the same shape like uh, in the motor mode. And here I'm increasing speed. So this is above synchronous speed and I have Again, some maximum torque generating more and more power, but then if I keep on increasing speed, 
uh, the power uh, will again decrease. Uh, the area here uh, on, uh, on this quadrant, you see I have positive torque, but I have negative speed or speed uh, or, or slip higher than one. So this means that in this area, the motor is uh, breaking the movement that I, uh, I apply to the shaft. So this acts as a brake and uh, I am applying current that is going in the opposite direction uh, for, for the movement. Uh, you can see that the torque is smaller uh, than uh, the nominal torque of the motor. So this is a typical shape. You can brake with an induction motor in this, in this mode, but uh, the braking torque that you apply is typically a little bit smaller uh, than the nominal operating torque that you would expect in the motor mode. Uh, of course, this is changing uh, with, uh, the, uh, with the properties of the motor. So uh, last time I showed you this Excel file where you can enter uh, the properties of the, of the machine and, and it will plot you uh, the torque speed characteristic. So you can play with, you, with it yourself and you can see how and what effects does it have. Uh, now, uh, how can we obtain the parameters uh, for the equivalent circuit diagram? Uh, we will need to do two separate tests uh, and uh, they will give us uh, the no load properties of the motor and then something that we will call short circuit or braked rotor properties. And we will use this to create uh, the uh, parameters for the equivalent circuit diagram. Uh, we can start uh, when uh, the motor is standing still. So the motor is standing still or it's braked and uh, it means that there is the maximum speed difference between the rotor speed which is zero and stator field speed which is uh, the synchronous speed. So at standstill uh, slip is one, so speed is, is zero. Uh, at standstill, uh, it's not turning, so uh, we will not have mechanical losses, since there is no speed, there can't be any mechanical losses, and uh, also the friction and eventual windage losses is zero. The, the rotor is not moving, so uh, all those components are, are zero. Uh, we can then calculate the uh, input power uh, by uh, using the equivalent circuit parameters. So we'll probably not go well to, to those uh, equations, but you can uh, see that uh, we can uh, calculate the startup torque. So, in other words, that's this point over here. This is the startup torque, and we can calculate it from the equivalent circuit diagram, and uh, we can see that it is influenced by uh, rotor resistance here. So uh, the rotor resistance has a major impact on the startup torque, and uh, when you will be playing with the Excel file, you may change this rotor resistance and you will see that it has an effect on the torque speed characteristic. So it's, the reason is exactly here. Uh, we are changing the rotor resistance and we uh, can uh, calculate the startup torque. Now, uh, if you look on this torque speed characteristic, uh, there is a very useful formula that allows you to calculate uh, the maximum torque for an induction motor if you know the slip and if you know the nominal parameters of the motor. Uh, this formula is called the Kloss formula and uh, it's not that difficult. You can see that I can calculate some torque for some specific sp slip that's slip S here, if I know the maximum torque and if I know uh, the slip at maximum torque. 
So uh, if you know both parameters, you can calculate torque or vice versa if you know, uh, for example, nominal torque here and uh, nominal slip and maximum slip, you can calculate maximal torque, and, for example. Okay, we will uh, not discuss this, uh, so this will not be a part of, of the, the exam. Uh, but we will discuss how uh, we can get the parameters uh, for the equivalent circuit diagram. So I already told you that we need to do two separate tests on the motor. I think you already had the class in the lab, so we have done that. Uh, we will do the no load test and we will do the blocked rotor test or other words uh, short circuit test. So the no load test is good if we want to get the, mm, uh, the magnetic properties of the motor, so uh, the losses in the magnetic circuit. If I go to let's say here to this equivalent circuit diagram you can see that uh, here on the top side, on the top picture, we have the whole, the whole circuit, the whole equivalent circuit diagram. But uh, if you look on the right side, which is the rotor, uh, you see that we are recalculating uh, the, uh, the resistance here uh, with slip. Since we are talking about the no load test. No load test means I'm not taking any power from the shaft and it also means I'm running the motor at synchronous speed. At synchronous speed slip is zero and therefore here this part uh, is uh, disconnected. So uh, we can see that we can all only have the current going through this part of the stator and through this, through this stator winding and uh, in a no load test uh, the current going through the rotor is zero. It's clear because we are running at synchronous speed there is no current induced in the rotor so, so this part is zero and the current can go only through this part. Uh, we can therefore uh, simplify the equivalent circuit diagram just to this part, if you compare this impedance to this impedance, you will find out uh, that uh, the major factor is this impedance of the magnetic circuit. So it is a simplification. Uh, we are neglecting uh, the properties of the stator in this no load test. So what you will get from the no load test is basically the current that is going into the motor and this current is covering the losses in the magnetic circuit. So from the no load test uh, you will get uh, the properties of the magnetic circuit. Uh, the no load test is carried under those conditions. Sha the shaft is free so there is no load connected uh, to the motor. Uh, the motor is uh, connected to an external mechanical supply that helps it to achieve synchronous speed. Uh, the induction motor by itself will not be able to achieve precisely synchronous speed. You always have some mechanical losses like friction in the bearings. So uh, if you want to get precise values in this kind of test, uh, you will be connecting this to an external motor or external dynamometer and you will drive this to synchronous speed. You know that in the classes, in the class where you have done that, uh, we have been driving uh, the motor with a dynamometer to a synchronous speed. Uh, the no-load test is done with the rated voltage. Uh, since here in the, the car in this circuit diagram we can see that the current is a function of the voltage. Uh, we need to do this in the same conditions uh, like the motor is built. So uh, we need to have the nominal voltage. 
in case of a three-phase motor, we will measure the input power. So we will do that with, with a wattmeter. Uh, and we will also measure line-to-line -line voltages and line currents so that we can calculate the power that is being consumed by the motor. So at the end, uh, we are expecting those parameters from the motor. Uh, we are not able to uh, separate uh, what is this component of the magnetizing reactants and uh, what is this component of the, uh, of the resistance from this kind of test. So at the end, uh, we will be getting the impedance of this kind of circuit and we will use that uh, in, this, in the circuit diagram. Uh, now the second test that we can do is uh, the blocked rotor test. So we are breaking the rotor so that it cannot rotate. And uh, this kind of test uh, is typically done uh, with reduced voltage. Why? If I break something and it wants to turn and uh, if I would use nominal voltage, it means that I would have very high input current. So uh, we are reducing uh, the power supply voltage for the motor uh, and uh, the reduction is done to a smaller current and typically this test is done for nominal current. Uh, if we are in um, any kind of circuit, we know that uh, the jowl losses in some circuit are proportional to resistance times square of current. Uh, if I want to have the same losses in uh, the circuit, I need to have the same current uh, like that, that corresponds to the nominal current of the motor. So in other words, uh, I will change the voltage during this test only to a very small value so that I have nominal current in the motor. Nominal current in the motor means nominal joule losses and therefore I cannot overheat the motor in this, in this kind of test. If I go back a little bit to, uh, to, this, to this picture, we can see that the stator copper losses are dependent on stator resistance and square of stator current. And since uh, in this kind of uh, block rotor test, I have the nominal current, I cannot overheat the motor because I am using the, mo the current for which the motor is designed. Uh, the block rotor test is uh, good uh, to determine the combination of stator and rotor resistance. So uh, it, this will give us uh, an idea about the resistance or, and reactance of this stator and rotor circuit. Uh, we cannot distinguish those two components from each other with this kind of test. So for example, if you have uh, a squirrel cage motor, you can do this test, but you cannot tell uh, exactly how much is the stator resistance and how much is the rotor resistance. Uh, from the equivalent circuit diagram over here, we still have this complete diagram. So in the blocked rotor test, we have a high current, a nominal current flowing through this part of the circuit. And the value of this current is uh, significantly higher, maybe two orders of magnitude, roughly, uh, than the current that is going through this uh, magnetizing circuit. So we can say, okay, in the no load, in the, in the blocked circuit test, we can neglect this part because there is a very small current, and we can assume that all current is going through the stator and through the rotor uh, of, the, of the machine. So in the blocked test, blocked rotor test, the circuit diagram gets again simplified and here we see this circuit diagram. We will be able to measure this resistance. So this is a sum of resistance of the stator and of the rotor. And 
from the phaser diagram, we will be able to measure this reactance, which again is a combination of uh, stator and rotor reactants. As I already said, we cannot distinguish the stator and rotor components. Uh, we can do a third measurement. Uh, we can measure separately the stator resistance. So if you take an ohmmeter, uh, you measure the stator resistance. Uh, this can allow you to separate those two components, rotor and stator, because uh, in the blocked rotor test, you have measured the sum, and with the ohmmeter, you are able to measure uh, the stator resistance. So then you can calculate the rotor resistance uh, by subtracting that. Uh, or there is a second option. Uh, if you have um, a slip ring uh, type of machine, so a, a wound rotor with slip rings, uh, you, can you can also measure uh, the rotor resistance uh, separately with, with an, some, some ohmmeter, for example. Uh, in any case, from none of those tests, you cannot distinguish uh, the stator uh, reactants and rotor reactants. So at the end, uh, we will have uh, the resistance and reactants of the rotor and of the stator. And we have all parameters that we, uh, we, requ we require. Uh, remember that the blocked rotor test was done uh, by, by uh, decreasing the voltage. So uh, if we want to uh, calculate that for nominal voltage, we can just multiply that by the ratio between the voltage we use and between the nominal voltage. That, that's, that this applies for the current. So we can calculate also the current during startup if the rotor would be braked by, by some load. Uh, now I have here uh, a numerical example uh, where we will see uh, roughly the parameters of uh, an induction motor uh, for about 30 horsepower. This is uh, for 60 hertz, so it's uh, for, uh, for US and for countries that are using 60 hertz frequency. Uh, and you can see roughly the parameters that were obtained by this, uh, by this um, three experiments that we just described. So during the no-load test, you see we have used nominal voltage. And the input power of this motor uh, was uh, 1,600 watts. So this is the power that is being consumed to cover uh, mechanical losses and uh, magnetic losses and uh, the current is 22 amperes so it's a definitely non-zero current so the motor is running free there is no load taken from uh, the shaft but it has non-zero current uh, the blocked rotor test was done for smaller voltage so we can see 21 volts so roughly about 10% of the three-phase uh, three phase voltage. Uh, and uh, the power it was taking was 2.1 kilowatts, current 71 amperes. And uh, uh, the DC test is used uh, to get the stator winding resistance. So uh, when it was powered by 12 volt, uh, the current was 75 amperes, and you can calculate the state of resistance from this. So it will be smaller than, than one ohm, definitely. Uh, this is the parameters of the motor. So nominal frequency is 60 hertz. Uh, number of poles is four. And uh, this is typically what you will find on the, uh, on the um, nameplate of the motor. Uh, so rated power, rated voltage, uh, plus rated current. Uh, this is the power factor of uh, the induction motor. This is a typical value. Um, 0 0.8 is something what you would expect for an induction motor. 
So we could calculate the parameters of the equivalent circuit diagram. So here you have um, the procedure how, uh, how this is done. For the motor you will, will or you ha have had already on, on the class, uh, you will do your own calculations. Uh, and here we see, okay, this is the, the resistance uh, of, the, of the, the, the total resistance uh, for single phase. And this is the, the reactance. Uh, the same can be done for the block rotor test, and uh, here you have an idea about the, the rotor resistance, which is typically much smaller uh, than the resistance of the stator. If you compare here this resistance in the stator, 27 ohms, and this is a rotor resistance 0 0.14 ohms. So the ro rotor has a small, very, very small resistance. Uh, we could calculate uh, other parameters such as uh, reactances and so on and so on. We'll not, we'll not do that. Uh, we'll just uh, discuss uh, the effect on uh, the parameters of especially the torque speed characteristic. Uh, so now uh, we have these parameters from the equivalent circuit diagram and we can use the equations to calculate the, torques, the torque speed characteristic. Uh, so this is um, uh, those are the rated parameters in the, in this example. Uh, so we, you can see, okay, uh, synchronous speed in this case would be 30 hertz, which is 1,800 rpm. This that's just for this type of uh, of uh, of motor. It's used in in this example. Uh, you see the power calculated now in kilowatt amperes instead of uh, horsepower. So that's um, also useful to be able to recalculate that. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so if there are no questions, we'll do now the, the Moodle test, uh, and then we'll uh, go further to single phase induction motors. So the Moodle test for today is called induction motor or induction M1. Uh, I have just started the session, so you should be able to log in and uh, uh, wait a few moments so that you're ready. There are four questions, as always, related to the previous lecture and. Uh, to the basics of uh, an indu induction motors. Are you ready? Okay, so I'm starting the quiz. Okay, so this was an easy question, not as easy as I expected. Uh, the voltages in a three-phase system are shifted by 120 degrees. 
Okay, question two. So here you have multiple answers that are correct. And you should select all components uh, that you will find in a squirrel cage induction motor. If you, if you select everything, you will get zero. I see. Sorry? In the motor, yes. No. Should not select everything. Okay, so uh, the components that you will find in an induction motor are end rings, laminated steel, of course, bearings, squirrel cage. Uh, you will find permanent magnets, not in induction motors, but in permanent magnet motors, so synchronous machines. Uh, you will find a commutator in DC motors and you will find DC field windings in DC motors. Okay, next one. So this is a numerical answer, you should ent enter a number. Uh, and uh, it's not it's not in percent. Okay, so the slip at standstill is one. And last one. This is also a numerical answer. So enter a number. Okay, so the torque at synchronous speed is how much? Zero. Zero. If you look on the torque speed characteristic, uh, it's zero. So uh, we are, we have used these two points. Uh, on the torque speed characteristic, so synchronous speed is over here, so zero torque, and slip equal zero, okay. and here that's, so no that's it for uh, three-phase induction motors, and now 
uh, we will discuss uh, single phase induction motors. Uh, three phase induction motors are very common. In fact, there are the most common types type of motors that you will find today uh, because they are reliable, uh, they have a relatively easy simple, simple construction uh, and so on and so on. So three phase motors are the most common types for higher powers. Uh, there are however applications where you may not have uh, three phase power available or the power that you require from the motor is relatively small. Uh, a typical example is, um, for example, fans, um, compressors, and so on. So applications where you have uh, only this type of, uh, of plug, like so single phase plug, and the power that you require is relatively small, a few hundred watts maximum. Uh, so in this case, uh, you can use a single phase induction motor. Uh, so we will find that in uh, refrigerators, you will find that in washing machines, uh, in some drills, not all drills, but in some of them, uh, you will find that in clocks and so on and so on. Uh, the construction of uh, a single phase induction motor is very, very similar to a three phase induction motor. We will see that basically there is only one difference that distinguishes three-phase motors and single-phase motors. Uh, the single-phase motor is uh, basically a two-phase machine. So uh, the name single-phase motor would probably imply that you have only one winding in the stator, but it would not work uh, with just one winding. Uh, if you run a three-phase motor only on two phases, uh, you will have a similar problem like with a single-phase induction motor that it will not be able to start without external help. So here, uh, the single-phase induction motor has one main winding that is creating the torque. And this main winding is powered at all times. And then it has one auxiliary winding or a starting winding that is used to create uh, a suitable shape of the magnetic flux so that the induction motor can start by itself. Uh, here we have uh, an example of uh, a single phase induction motor. So from the outside it's looking exactly the same uh, like uh, a three phase induction motor. Uh, it has also uh, the iron core. This iron core is laminated. It has windings and the windings is placed in the slot. It has slot insulation here, uh, those pieces in, in the slots and it will have some housing. So from the outside it, you can't probably tell if this is a, a single phase or a three phase induction motor. Uh, if you see the terminal box, you will be able to see that uh, a three-phase induction motor uh, will have either three terminals, usually, or usually oh, it can also have six terminals so that you can change between the Y and delta connection. Uh, but a single-phase induction motor will have only two terminals. And it's internally connected uh, to work properly. Now, how does it work? Uh, if you would use a single phase winding, uh, it would not start the motor. So let's imagine we have just this type of motor. Let's say now in the motor I will have just this winding and this winding. So there are no auxiliary winding uh, currently connected. So I am powering only the main winding which here uh, is uh, marked in a uh, in, in red. Uh, we are again using AC voltage, so sinusoidal voltage. This sinusoidal voltage will create current and the current will create magnetic flux. So if I would power uh, this type of uh, single phase induction motor, uh, 
uh, I would create a pulsating magnetic flux. It is changing the size, but it's not changing direction. So I would have a magnetic field that is moving up and down here, something like this. But it, will, it would not be a rotating magnetic field that can create torque in a three-phase induction motor. Uh, therefore, I need to have an additional winding that will add its magnetic flux to the flux from the main winding. So, for example, this winding here. And I will power this during startup, and this will create me magnetic flux, and this will create me torque. So, here you can see that the single phase induction motor is, in fact, a two phase motor that has uh, two windings. So this is the main winding, this is the auxiliary winding, and in this case they are uh, having an angle of 90 degrees. So they are perpendicular to each other. Uh, the rotor of the single phase induction machine is exactly the same uh, like the rotor of uh, the three phase induction motor. So uh, this is a typical example, a square clutch rotor, again, a shaft and bars here, and the winding is, is a molten aluminum uh, that is, it was pressed into, uh, into this, uh, the slots. Again, it's, uh, it's laminated. So now, uh, how does it, that work? Uh, we have discussed last week uh, the creation of a rotating magnetic field. So uh, from three-phase voltage, uh, we can create a rotating magnetic field. Uh, from a two-phase voltage, we cannot create a magnetic field that is rotating, but uh, we will be creating something like an elliptical magnetic field. So uh, it will have higher magnetic flux on some specific direction. And uh, we can simplify the creation of this uh, magnetic field by uh, imagining that we have two fields that, that are rotating in the opposite direction. So uh, let me go all the way back to a three-phase machine. All the way, all the way. Sure. Okay, so for example, this, this picture. This is a three-phase machine. So we have three-phase windings. You see one winding, second winding, third, and so on. So it's just two, two coils. And when I connect this to an AC three-phase voltage, it creates a magnetic field that is rotating uh, with some given frequency. If I do this with a single phase motor, I can say that uh, if I would use only one winding, so the main winding, I am creating a pulsating magnetic flux that is moving up and down. And I can imagine that this pulsating magnetic flux is a sum of two rotating magnetic fields that are rotating in the opposite direction. So if I want to remove this pulsating magnetic flux and create rotation, I need this auxiliary winding. So we will need to add two components in this, uh, in this uh, magnetic field. You can see it here. So we can imagine that this is one magnetic flux from one, let's say, virtual uh, rotating magnetic field. And this is the opposite direction. If they sum, I need, I, I will have this direction and a different size. But without the auxiliary winding, it will still be in a single direction. So uh, we can connect the auxiliary winding to uh, a circuit that will provide us a different voltage with a different phase. So either we could have a two-phase power network uh, 
which we don't, but we could create that. Uh, and we could power this starting winding with the second, uh, second phase in, in our system. Or we can connect this uh, to, hold on, uh, we can connect this uh, to uh, a capacitor, for example. From AC circuits that we have discussed on the very beginning of uh, the course, we, s we know that if we have a capacitor, it is changing the phase shift between voltage and current. So if I am powering the uh, auxiliary winding through a capacitor, I can use this in single phase induction motor running just on single phase and the auxiliary winding here that is powered in, in blue, uh, it's, it's powered with a voltage with a phase shift different from the main winding. So I am now have two currents. One is powered directly through the main winding that's coming from the power network. The other one is coming also from the power network but it's coming through a capacitor. It means it's phase shifted. And I'm adding two magnetic fields that are now phase shifted. So here I have this main magnetic flux plus the starting winding magnetic flux and this will create me um, a rotating magnetic field as well. So, uh, what will be the impact of uh, the single phase induction motor on uh, the torque speed characteristic? If you power it directly from the power network without any external capacitors, you will find out that the torque speed characteristic looks like this. And uh, it's similar, well it looks similar at first uh, to, the, uh, to the three phase motor, but here at zero speed, if you would go further here, you would find out that it has zero torque. So without an external capacitor, without any external winding that is being powered by a second power supply with a different phase shift, uh, the starting torque of the single phase induction motor is zero. It's the same like if you would run a three phase induction motor on two phases, it would not start itself without any mechanical help. But when the motor is already running, you can stop the power supply for the auxiliary winding and you can keep on powering the motor with uh, just a single phase, with just the main winding. So uh, the motor runs somewhere around here. You see, again, we have some operating point over there, which is still in the linear part of the characteristic. The synchronous speed is somewhere here. Synchronous speed still corresponds to torque zero. Uh, and here, we still have some maximum value of torque. But uh, if I power uh, the auxiliary winding, I don't need uh, to power it at all times. So I can have a switch connected in series with this starting winding or auxiliary winding. And uh, if uh, the motor is already running, I can disconnect uh, this uh, auxiliary winding and I can keep powering only the main winding. Uh, for this reason, uh, single phase induction motors are typically built in such a way that only the main winding is designed for uh, a continuous current. So only the main winding is designed, means the wire diameter and cooling is done in such a way that it can work, but the starting winding is designed so that the starting current is happening only for a short period of time. For example, five, maybe 10 seconds. So you power it up, you start the motor, 
and then the switch will disconnect this starting winding when the motor is running. Uh, the switch can either be um, a time switch, so you set the starting time for five seconds, for example, and then you disconnect that, or it can be a centrifugal switch, which means that it disconnects the motor when the speed is above some given level. Uh, what are the properties uh, of this connection? Uh, so, we know that we need to shift the voltage in the auxiliary winding by some means. Uh, there are different ways how you can do that. Not only the capacitor uh, can be used, but you can use also uh, different, uh, different uh, connections. Uh, so, we can do this by connecting a capacitor in series with uh, the auxiliary winding. This is the most typical way how this is done. And it's the most typical way because it has uh, lower losses uh, than the other, uh, other ways. That is not the only way. Uh, we can use a resistor that creates a current going through uh, the auxiliary winding. Then the phase shift is created by the combination of inductance of the auxiliary winding and uh, of this resistance. So it's not as good uh, as uh, the capacitor. Plus, if you have a resistor, you will have jowl losses that are created on the resistor. So this will have higher losses uh, than uh, the capacitive way. How it's done? Uh, you can see it over here. So. Uh, this is a schematic of a, a single phase induction motor that is using, um, using uh, a centrifugal switch. So we see that the main winding is powered at all times over here. This is the rotor. And the starting winding is connected into the circuit with the centrifugal switch. And this is the capacitor that I can connect in series uh, with the with the, the auxiliary winding. So uh, when I start it, this centrifugal switch is closed. Speed is lower than some level. Uh, current is flowing into the main winding. It's flowing also into the starting winding through the capacitor. And here we have difference in phase shift and we can start the motor. When the motor uh, is uh, running above uh, some given speed, uh, we can uh, disconnect this centrifugal switch uh, and then this will be disconnected and the current will flow only uh, through the main winding. So what will be the effect uh, on the torque speed characteristic? So when I start the motor we have the two windings connected at the same time. So uh, the characteristic will be similar to uh, a three-phase motor. So it will have non-zero startup torque. So here you can see uh, this is again, uh, this is speed right now, and this is torque. So when I combine the two windings together, I have this type of uh, characteristic. So here is the startup torque. I can start the motor. The motor is starting, and at this speed, it's where the centrifugal switch will disconnect uh, the uh, auxiliary winding. If I would start without the auxiliary winding, this is the torque speed characteristic of a single phase induction motor. You see it starts at zero, so it will not start itself. But if you provide some external mechanical push, you will start the motor or we may start it with the auxiliary winding. And at this time, the centrifugal switch turns on, or sorry, off, and here it keeps on increasing the speed until it reaches uh, roughly the operating point or uh, the, the synchronous speed if it's un unloaded. Uh, you can see the effect 
Here I'm switching between this characteristic and between this characteristic. So when it's running on a single phase, it has a smaller torque, but it can still run uh, because it's already running. If it stops, uh, the motor will not be able to start itself without the action of the centrifugal switch. So uh, those induction motors can be also directly three-phase motors. If you buy a three-phase induction motor, uh, you connect it to a single phase with an external capacitor. It may run in this mode as a single phase induction motor. But it's not very convenient to use it because you're wasting uh, basically the third winding that you have uh, in the stator. It's better uh, to have uh, a ready-made single phase induction motor which is only two windings and an external capacitor. Because you don't have everywhere three-phase networks. Uh, you may have three-phase network for motors, for labs, for homes, for, for workshops, uh, but uh, in a kitchen, uh, you probably will not have a three-phase uh, connection. So uh, those single-phase motors are used in smaller appliances. Uh, like refrigerators, pumps, and so on, where you only have a uh, single-phase power network. So single-phase motors are not used for large applications. So uh, you will not find uh, single-phase induction motors for 100 kilowatts, for example, because for, one, for this kind of power, uh, the current going through the line would be very big. And since uh, in the three-phase network, the current is much smaller. Uh, larger appliances are using three-phase power because the current is smaller and we can have thinner wires. And this means it's less expensive. It has smaller losses than three times bigger uh, connection wires for single phase. Uh, the last thing that I want to discuss today is a, a modification uh, of um, a single phase induction motor. Uh, here we have seen different ways how we can create uh, the phase shift between uh, the auxiliary current and between the main current. Uh, this is used for motors maybe up to 500 watts, one, one kilowatt, but not much bigger. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not very useful to use this approach uh, for very small motors. And by very small motors, I mean motors uh, with power of 5 watt, 10 watts, something, something in this range. There are applications where you need this kind of small power. And in this area, it is, you, it is uh, better to use something that's called a shaded pole motor. And this is a modification uh, of uh, the uh, single phase induction motor. I will probably start with uh, the picture here. Uh, so a shaded pole mo motor is essentially a single phase induction motor. Uh, so you can see here, this is the main winding that is powered at all times. And here, this is the rotor. And now this kind of motor will not start itself without any external help. So I can connect a capacitor. But the disadvantage of capacitors is that uh, in time, they degrade. So it means that if you want to use the motor in 10 years, you will probably have to replace the starting capacitor because it dries out. So uh, in applications where you care about reliability and don't care that much about efficiency for small or really small powers, you can use this shaded pole motor. The difference is that this kind of motor has an additional winding that you can see over here, it's called a shaded pole. Uh, the function is very simple. 
the main magnetic flux here creates the magnetic field and now we have a magnetic field and we insert an additional winding in this magnetic field. This main magnetic field is AC changing uh, and it will induce additional currents into this auxiliary winding. This current will create its own magnetic field. So now we have a magnetic field from the main winding and an additional magnetic field from the shaded pole, from the winding. Uh, there is a phase shift about 90 degrees uh, between those two magnetic fields. So this winding will act uh, as a help during startup. The disadvantage of this is that it has a small efficiency because this is powered at all times. You have jaw losses in this winding. And uh, the efficiency of this shaded pole motor can be very small. Uh, it can be maybe 5% or 10%, something like this. A very small number. But uh, as those motors are used in applications with very small power, like 5 watts, 10 watts, uh, you, don't, you don't really care about the, the, the input power. If you have 5 watt power, then you may have uh, 15 or 20 watts input power, depending on efficiency, and this is still acceptable. So uh, the shaded pole motors are used in fans, for example. So small fans can be powered with this, uh, with this type of uh, shaded pole motor. It's very reliable. Uh, you can find that also in uh, in other applications like uh, like many years ago it was used in uh, uh, in, in disc players to, because uh, it uh, used uh, it requires very small small power and uh, the goal is reliability here you don't need any external components so this is an, another example so this is the winding. Uh, if you remove uh, the, the rotor and you keep only uh, the stator, then it looks like this. So again, this is the stator laminated, and this is the winding that is creating the helping magnetic flux uh, to make it run. Uh, we'll now, now go back to, uh, to this picture. Mm, so you see here the schematic uh, principle of uh, this kind of motor. So here we have uh, the rotor winding. It's still a squirrel cage like for three-phase or one-phase induction motors. And here we see the main winding. Here we see the shaded pole, one winding here, one winding here. Shaded pole, uh, the name comes from the fact that it's hidden inside of the motor uh, and uh, it's wound around this pole and this pole, and this helps you to create the magnetic flux. Any questions? Okay.